So what phase are we in? What numbers should we expect? And how do we think services are going to cope, especially if the virus cannot be warded off until warmer months? Neil Dixon is with us, who's Chief Executive of the NHS Confederation, representing organisations across healthcare who are preparing for intense pressure. Neil, thanks very much for being with us. Um, Tell us about how you feel about the government's plans and if that translates to what you and your organisations have been told on the ground. Is is everybody comfortable that we're we're moving in in the same direction together? I don't think anybody is particularly comfortable at the moment. I think the NHS is bracing itself. The first point to make is that the service is already under very intense pressure. Of course, we we are in one sense, in parts of the country, you'll see the beginnings of moving out of the winter months, but we're still pretty much in that phase where there's a lot of virus around anyway, and NHS organisations are coping with very full accident emergency departments and very full hospitals and very stretched community services. Mm. I would say in relation to the guidance and so on coming out, you get kind of, you always do get mixed reactions. I think a lot of our members would say we get an awful lot of this guidance is coming. Um, But actually today I heard uh, members talk about a bit more detailed guidance coming. That's good. It's a bit Mm -hmm. more particular and it feels almost more real. And that's sort of frightening in its own way. Uh, Obviously, NHS organisations are pretty well geared up for so-called business continuity which is a euphemism for you know when something big comes and might interrupt business continuity and so they are pretty good at emergency planning and the like but there will be more particular things that are going to come out Uh, and what I think this is revealed today is a bit more about the escalation procedure we're not we're nowhere near the, the sense of the NHS sort of oh we can't cope with what's happening in coronavirus at the moment all the cases are being dealt with really in specialist units that are able to cope with it but as this escalates first of all we're seeing 111 services being put under a lot of strain and Mm -hmm. the government's put in a lot more money into that more people more people learning how to go online 111 which is great news and maybe after over the virus is over that's one benefit that instead of people turning up in A&E they can use those services which can be can be really helpful but then also preparing for you know what if there are large numbers of people not only you get the virus, and for most people it will be mild, but end up in hospital, then how, how are we going to cope with that? And of course that will mean things like routine operations having to be uh, delayed. And Big waiting list for elective operations already. Yeah, and that means they will go up. So one of the things I, I guess after the virus we would be certainly looking at would be we we will need extra resource to try and get those waiting lists and so on back down but it absolutely makes sense and the NHS although it's under great strain is really good at flexing and that means clearing out uh, wards of patients who absolutely need help but don't need to be there desperately and therefore creating that extra space for patients if there are large numbers of patients who, who require okay. who require that treatment. And Neil, what about doctors and nurses uh, who've recently retired or just left f- the profession for whatever reason, coming back to work? Yes, again, of course, you do require, for example, doctors require to be uh, revalidated and to see that they are properly up to date. But if we got into a really serious uh, situation where large numbers of staff were affected by the virus and therefore services were not viable, it makes absolute sense to have contingency plans where you can bring it on, bring back staff. Will uh, they be who, able to re-register be... in time? Because that takes a bit of a process, doesn't it? Well, there are means by which uh, regulators can speed up that process. So I would expect uh, that if you were expecting somebody to operate in their professional capacity, mm-hmm. now maybe you could bring somebody back. They, d- they don't need to work as a qualified nurse. They could I be, see. for example, helping out and supporting without uh, requiring their registered qualification. But it's also true that, uh, that, that regulators are capable of uh, fast-tracking things uh, in those conditions kind of circumstances. Are you expecting an imminent uh, explosion in cases, a, a rise, certainly significant rise? 
Well, to be honest, you'd be much better asking a, a real expert on this. But I think the the expectation from the services it, it it's not going to rise, you know, tomorrow by a very dramatic dramatic amount. But I think all the indications are that we are likely to see transmission become widespread, and that mm -hmm. the hope that we might have been able to contain this to very small numbers, I think that is looking less likely now. The reality is that the good news about this virus is it's not very serious. In a way, the bad news about that is that people don't notice they've even got it and therefore um, they're, they're likely to spread it. And I think the advice around washing hands, probably keeping distance, not shaking hands, all that stuff makes an awful lot of sense. And I think increasingly as we go through this process, people will start okay. to kind of take that advice on board. And just very quickly, if you could, Neil, the capacity of, of, of social care settings, because obviously these are some of the people that are going to be most at risk, elderly people, people with underlying health care conditions, and uh, the, the people obviously employed to, to look after them. How concerned are you about people in those settings? Well, I think that is a concern. And again, I think the government has moved a bit today to provide a bit more support and uh, communication with the social care sector. We, we shouldn't regard health and social care as separate. They're entirely integrated, as it were. And of course, the people who are, for example, in residential and nursing homes are among the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so they should be absolutely taking steps to make sure that uh, their residents are as, as protected as, as they possibly can be. And of course, that will mean, for example, making sure that visitors wash their hands, that okay. they discourage cont direct contact uh, with those uh, residents, uh, e even though, the, you know, they can have normal conversations and so forth. But I think increasingly we want to try and protect these individuals mm -hmm. because it is them, who, those who have, you know, various comorbidities, yeah. we call They're underlying conditions, risk. that are the most vulnerable. Thank you very much, Neil. Good to talk to you. Neil Dixon, Chief Executive of the NHS Confederation.